Well, one of the most important things that God ever asks us to do for Christ and his kingdom also happens to be one of the hardest, sharing the good news. We know it's our responsibility to witness. We know people can't believe the gospel until they hear the gospel. We know that Jesus gave us a great commission to go into all the world and proclaim the good news. We know we need to be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. We, we know that the most important thing that any one person can say to another person is not, I love you, but Jesus loves you so much that he gave his life for your sins. And we do know this. According to the most recent spiritual life survey that many of you filled out late last semester, 90% of Wheaton students agree or strongly agree that they want to share their faith in the hope that others one day will follow Christ. And nearly the same percentage say they understand and can articulate the gospel. Praise God. But there are major obstacles, and the survey also showed that, and you know what they are, starting with being worried what someone else will think, how they will respond when you start talking to them about Jesus. That's a fear. In other words, the biggest reason why people who know the way to eternal life don't show other people the way is because we are afraid of rejection. Call it evangelophobia, the fear of telling other people about Jesus, which sadly, if you think about it, can be a fatal condition, not for you, but for the person who needs to hear. How can we overcome these obstacles and do one of the most important things that God will ever call us to do? I think it helps to understand that we don't have to bring people to faith all by ourselves. Like everything else in our spiritual formation, worshiping together, hearing God's word together, praying together, serving together, entering into God's rest together, we also do evangelism in Christian community, call it witnessing together. And it has always been God's intention for his people to spread the glory of his name in community. When Martin Luther King Jr. looked back on the record of the early church and their example and considered what it means for our witness today, he said, we must capture the spirit of the early church. Wherever the early Christians went, they made a triumphant witness for Christ. Whether on the village streets or in the city jails, they daringly proclaimed the good news of the gospel. And we've seen dramatized for us this morning a beautiful example of that from Luke chapter 10. Jesus had been doing one of the most important things he ever did and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. But it was never his intention to do this work all by himself. In fact, this is one of the reasons why he told his disciples later that they would do greater things in his name after he departed because he knew they would go out in the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaim the gospel. And so he began training some witnesses who in turn could train the church to become his witnesses. And in this way, the gospel would come to you and to me, and eventually the whole world would receive the good news. Jesus sent them out two by two in advance to every place where he himself was about to go. These gospel heralds went out like the animals on Noah's Ark. And the wisdom of this, I think, is fairly obvious. If you do something by yourself, you might easily get discouraged, give up. You go out in a pair and you have constant companionship. There's somebody to pray with before you enter a new town. There, you can take turns sharing a testimony. If someone asks you a really hard question, you don't need to phone a friend. You've got a friend right there and maybe they know the answer. Together, you can work your way through the gospel. And if you encounter any difficulty on your travels, there is someone else right there to help with the problem solving. And there would be, there would be problems. If you look at the whole context of Luke chapter 10, Jesus goes on to explain, some people are gonna reject you. 
You're going to face snakes and scorpions. The devil himself, the greatest of all enemies, will try to stop you. But none of this is anything to be afraid of when you are standing side by side with someone else to share the gospel. When the people of God bear witness for God together, we have the power of God over all the hosts of hell. That's the message that Jesus gave to his disciples. And Christians have been witnessing together ever since. On the very first day that the apostles preached in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says with great power, the apostles gave testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's grace was upon all. This was a community effort of gospel proclamation. And if you trace the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul, he always has a traveling companion with him, Silas, Barnabas. Sometimes there's a larger team, Timothy, Titus, Dr. Luke. Even when Paul ended up in prison, his witness wasn't isolated. At the end of Colossians, he, tells, he invites people to pray for him, and he, he gives a personal request, but it's in the plural. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. I don't think Paul there is using a sort of apost royal apostolic we. He's including with him the people that are standing with him in his witness for the gospel. And the church is still doing that today. Next September, the Lausanne movement will host on its 50th anniversary, its fourth global Congress on world evangelization. Um, I'll be privileged to be there. And in fact, uh, in about a month, I'm gonna bring to chapel the six plenary speakers from different continents all over the world. I'm gonna have you pray for them Amen. as they gather on this campus to begin thinking about those messages. 5,000 evangelists in Seoul in September from literally every country of the world, literally every country will be represented. Doing some preparatory readings, I came across a statement from evangelist Sam Cho who wanted to explain why he and his colleagues used the word missional instead of mission to describe this kingdom work. He says the word mission in Korean is pronounced sungyo. I mean, close enough, hopefully. Literally, its meaning is to spread a religion which isn't very specific about Christianity. So Cho goes on to explain the word we use is missional, without referring to its English meaning because it sounds like mission eol, and that little ending E-O-L in Korean means the collective spirit of a community. And he goes on to say, so mission eol in that sense implies that the Holy Spirit of God in mission is present and working among the followers of Jesus. He, the Spirit awakens people and connects us to be a new wave of mission to reflect the glory of the Lord together. That's what Sam Cho says, and that's what I want to be part of, a community connected by the Holy Spirit, which has a collective spirit of witness and therefore is able to do more for the global kingdom of God by proclaiming Jesus together. So how do we do this? Well, we start by making sure we know what the gospel is. Can I just take a moment to remind you? When Jesus commanded his disciples to go into all the world and preach the good news, he had something very specific in mind. He meant his crucifixion for the forgiveness of sins and his resurrection with the power of eternal life. The gospel is the cross and the empty tomb which call us to repentance and faith. You repent of sin at the cross of Christ, you are completely forgiven. You believe in the risen Lord Jesus, you receive the free gift of eternal life. And notice that truly sharing the gospel is more specific than just telling people about God. It, it certainly goes beyond simply telling people how you came to Christ, although that can be helpful. It's not really telling people what you did in response to Jesus. It's more about what Jesus did, specifically what he did by dying on the cross and rising from the grave with an invitation to repent of sin and believe in Jesus. You'll never go far wrong in any personal witness for Christ if you just keep in mind the cross and the empty tomb, crucifixion and resurrection, invitation to repent and believe. And if that's what the gospel is, maybe sharing the gospel is a little easier than we sometimes think. 
But because we do still hold back, some of us, I want to give you some easy ways to do this. One is simply to make sure that other people know you're a Christian and that this is core to your identity. There are plenty of non-annoying ways, just to make that clear. Mention to a coworker that you went to church over the weekend, just as part of the conversation about what you've done and what you're doing. When friends are talking about something having to do with public life, maybe an issue that, on which people disagree, just tell them what you think and start with the words, well, as a Christian, and then just go on and say what you think. Now, there's, there's some things that are scary about that, particularly because most of us know we're not the best example of what Christians believe or how Christians ought to behave. There's an accountability that comes with letting people know you follow Christ. But you have the Spirit of God living in you. It ought to make a difference that people can see. And one of the ways we make Jesus legible to people is by making sure that they know that we follow Christ. Donald Whitney looks back with disappointment at a conversation he had in law school. He'd been praying for the salvation of a, someone who had become a very close friend. He was trying to be a good spiritual example. And one day before class, his friend turned to him and asked this question, why are you so happy all the time? What a question. I mean, that's the opportunity of a lifetime. It's one of the softest pitches in the history of evangelism. I, I read this account. I imagined the angels in heaven leaning forwards to hear what Whitney would say. I mean, it was a crucial moment. That was a moment that could have counted for eternity. And it, it wasn't hard. Whitney, Whitney could have said, well, it's all about Jesus, or that's a great question. Let's talk about it after class. Do you know what he actually said? He said, I don't know. I don't know? <laughs> What kind of answer is that? I imagine the angels in heaven throwing up their arms and saying, come on, man, you're training to be a lawyer. Surely you can come up with a better answer than that. And of course, Whitney regretted his response. At the very least, we can let people know we are Christians and they can reach their own spiritual conclusions from that. Let your life be one of the lenses through which other people have an opportunity to see Jesus, and even if it's a little blurry, they'll see him. Amen. Then once people know your commitment to Christ, learn how to ask good spiritual questions. What are you hoping for? What are you living for? What do you think about life after death? That's somebody, every, something everybody thinks about. If someone's having a problem, just ask if you can offer a short prayer, even just a little 30-second prayer. People who need help almost never say no. Here's another thing you can do. Invite people to church or to some other gathering where they can learn about Jesus. Remember, we are witnessing together. You don't have to do all the proclaiming and explaining. Let your pastor do the preaching and let some gifted apologist answer the hard questions people have about Christianity. We've had a marvelous example of that this week with Rebecca McLaughlin on campus. But at least do your part and do the invitation. Give your friends and family some opportunity to find the grace that you know. And believe in the Holy Spirit enough to hope that they will repent and believe. The same Holy Spirit that changed your life certainly can change somebody else's life. And he can even use your life to help do it. And don't forget to pray by name for people who need to know Jesus by name. When people come to Christ, it's usually the answer to many prayers. Friends, family members, people that don't even know each other actually are praying for the same person because they've seen the spiritual need. They're asking God to intervene in someone's life. If you're not the inviter or the preacher, at least be part of the prayer team. Amen. I love the account C.S. Lewis gives of his little prayer journal. And it was his practice to list by name people he knew that he, as far as he could see, thought needed to, to know Jesus. And he talks about what a joy it was for him when he was able to transfer those names to the other list of people who did know Jesus but still needed God's grace in their lives. Talk to one person. Invite one person. Pray for one person. We don't have to do it all, but 
we all do need to do our part. And when it comes to sharing our faith, there's actually nothing to be afraid of. Let me just advise you, don't wait until you become more confident. Do you think that day is really going to come where you feel so confident in your abilities as an evangelist? That time may never come, so you should start now. And don't be afraid to fail either. That is normal. I was so interested to read, according to Barna Research, nine out of ten, time, nine out of ten times when Christians share their faith, they believe that they failed. <laughs> That's challenging to do something and feel that you have failed at doing it. But the Holy Spirit uses what we offer, even if he uses it many years later. The Spirit is at work. And with each little step we take sharing the gospel, the more we see God at work, the more we recognize that the Spirit is doing work, the more confident we become. Most of us need to have more of the courage of our convictions. You may recognize Penn Gillette as the name of one of the world's most famous magicians, Penn and Teller. He's also an outspoken atheist, which I think makes the challenge that he gave to Christians all the more compelling. Here it is. I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you could believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. I mean, how much do you have to hate people not to proselytize? Wow. Wow. How much do you have to, to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? End quote. Those are good questions. If not evangelizing is a way of hating, and I think... I think Penn Jillette is pretty much calling it like it is. And sharing the good news is a way of loving. Then for the sake of eternal souls, we need to love people enough to tell them what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. Recently, I, I read the story of how Randy Lubier came to Christ. Sadly, both of Randy's sons lost their girlfriends in the space of three weeks, one by suicide and the other in a fatal car crash family was devastated. Randy went to the funerals. He, he wished desperately he could find something to say that would encourage these grieving parents. They were suffering the unimaginable pain of losing their precious daughters. He didn't have any spiritual encouragement to give. He, he just didn't have the words. To Randy's surprise, at both funeral services, people ministered to him and to his sons, including people who were mourning their own losses. They were more concerned, it seemed, about what he was going through than about their own pain, and it didn't make sense to him. Who is like that, he asked. What's going on here? She just lost her daughter, her best friend, and she wants to care for me and for my son? Who does that? Another woman came up to him and said, hey, you know, our, our pastor is here. Would you like to meet him? Randy thought, no, I don't meet pastors. I, I, don't, I don't like pastors. And yet he found himself saying politely, sure, that would be fine. <laughs> Afterwards, on his way home, his wife turned to him and said, I'm going to go start going to church. And it was brave for her to say because she knew Randy hated church, didn't particularly care for church people. But he went to church too, mainly to be supportive. His father-in-law sent him a Bible, the one book he swore he would never read. He picked it up and he said, God, if you're in this book, I am going to be super upset because I will have been wrong for 50 years. But I guess I want to know. He read his Bible cover to cover. He fell in love. First with the God of the Old Testament as a personal God, and then with his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, he was a little worried. He loved God so much in the Old Testament, he was afraid to turn to the New Testament. He wasn't sure he would love God as much. And then he, then he met Jesus, and it was the same God. He could see it right away. He started meeting every week with his pastor, asking lots of questions. Eventually, he gave his life to Christ. And what I want you to see is how many witnesses helped him get there. A caring friend, 
who offered comfort, a grieving mother who brushed her tears away long enough to share hope with him, a patient pastor who answered his questions, family members who invited him to church, gave him a Bible. They were witnessing together. And if you ask the question, who led Randy Lubier to Christ? They all did, each playing their own part. And ultimately, of course, the Holy Spirit did. But he used those people, their personalities, their boldness, their kindness. He used all of that to bring a man to Jesus Christ. And there is no greater joy in the world than seeing someone repent and believe in Jesus. And I think we see that so clearly in Luke chapter 10, verse 21. I think it's one of the most remarkable verses in the Bible. It's, on, it's one of the only verses that refers in a single verse explicitly to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's actually quite rare in the Bible to have them all in one verse. It's the Holy Trinity in a single sentence, which says that in the hour those 72 evangelists came running back to testify that they had seen the good news break the power of Satan and bring people into the kingdom of God. In that hour, Jesus... Have you noticed this? Rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to little children. Father, yes, this is your gracious will. Here's a mystery I don't think we're ever going to understand. The joy of the Son of God expressed in the Spirit of God to his Father God. It's triune joy, specifically in the salvation of sinners I believe that that triune joy was present when you gave your life to Christ. It wasn't just here in Luke chapter 10. This is how how the loving God feels about the salvation of sinners. And part of that joy becomes yours when you play even the littlest part in leading somebody else to Christ. You'll be happy about that for the rest of eternity. Recently, I received a a note from my friend, Steve Rohr, and just wanted to say how happy he was to find out that he had helped lead somebody to Christ. Steve was my best friend in first grade. Uh, We came to Wheaton together, and then he went off to do missionary work in Japan. He's been there for decades, slow, faithful, sometimes discouraging work as a school principal. He's written to me about all of that decade after decade. And in a recent newsletter, he wrote to say that he and his wife, Jemmy, were very encouraged to meet with one of our students who we taught 35 years ago when we first went to Japan. Back when she was in high school, we told her about Jesus. We prayed for her. Years later, she came to Christ. Then her sister, her father, her mother, her daughter, they all came to Christ. With tears in her eyes, she thanked us for going to Japan to tell people like her about Jesus. And here's what I wonder. Who's the person that's going to come back and thank you for telling them about Jesus, for praying for them in a spiritual way? You may think in that moment that you failed, as it seems in the moment like many evangelistic encounters do. But I tell you, you will be having joy with the loving Father and the rejoicing Son and the life-giving Spirit about that forever. Amen. Let's worship God with our closing song. Let's have our musicians come and lead us. Let's stand together.